showing interest in this incredibly important subject. Uh, my name is Anis Harrison and I'm a Swedish Jamaican artist and educator based in London and I'll be hosting this seminar. Uh, we're going to hear from people who are in the front line of diversity in art and we're going to look at some issues that emerged recently but also some long-standing issues that we face. And we're also going to talk about the things that are out there to help us with diversity and some of the latest developments. Um, I would like everybody to, I'd like to encourage questions, uh, just write them in the comment box. And if your questions is for a particular speaker, please put them in the name, their names in capital letters and we direct the questions to the speaker in the end of the discussion. And we are going to try to fit them all in. I'd like to uh, also draw attention to that this is hosted by the Carif Center which is a center in Camden, a community center, that are encouraging uh, or helping with educational needs for black uh, people and people of colors and people of low income, educational needs. And the center uh, manager, Farid, is uh, gonna join us later with the questions. And she's, I've started this online platform to encourage us to share different ideas and debates of current issues. Uh, right, let me first introduce you to our fantastic contributors. We got Asma Astwani, who is a self-taught London-born artist and founder of the Riot Soup uh, Art Collective for Women of Colour. We got Ellie Pinnick, which is the founder or and director of the Guts Gallery. And Tinu uh, Fugbarun, I probably pronounced that surname wrong, <laughs> is a British Nigerian illustrator living in London. And she's also part of the Riot Soup Collective for Women of Colour. Right, I'm going to start. Asma, can you tell me of your experience of diversity? or maybe lack of it in the art world, and give us a little bit of background about how you started the Riot Soup Collective. Hi, thank you, I will. Uh, hi everyone. Um, so I started Riot Soup um, in January 2019. Um, the previous December, December 2018, I was made redundant from a job, which I hated and I felt very disempowered in. And I saw the redundancy as an opportunity to sort of pursue the thing that I love, which is art and an art career. And I thought the first step to like, going for that would be to connect with other artists and other people who were in the industry. And I couldn't really find anyone that I identified with or, you know, I couldn't find any like-minded people to vibe with or to work with. And um, yeah, so I, I put a call out online to see if anyone was feeling the way that I was feeling about the lack of diversity representation in the arts. And I was sliding into people's DMs and saying, oh, I'm doing this thing, will you join? And a lot of people ignored me. A lot of people said no, but I kept going. And then the right people turned up. And in January, we had an amazing meeting. And off the back of the meeting, we had an exhibition three months later and we, we, we curated it, we put it together, we installed it, we did everything, the marketing, fundraising, absolutely everything. And then it sort of snowballed from there. And I think where it is now, never, never expected it to be where it is now. Um, it's very, very exciting. I think we all feel very empowered and we feel like sort of anything is possible. And maybe we feel a bit more, a bit braver to tackle some you know, challenges and things because we have each other um, to do it with. <laughs> Brilliant. And yeah. can you tell me, has it led to any sort of ways with other institutions that you got in contact with or anything like that, that um, being with a collective? Well, yeah, um, the, the Tate sort of noticed me from my Instagram um, and I was allowed an opportunity to uh, do a workshop with them at, at the gallery uh, which was great and I feel like if it wasn't for the backing of Riot Soup and having that behind me I, I wouldn't have been able to maybe even go for it in the same way 
Um, so I think it's been good for that reason. And you know, you've called us here today to talk about diversity within the arts. So like, we're building a really nice community thanks to Riot Soup. Um, Great, thank I'm you. I'm excited to see where it will go. Brilliant, brilliant. Ellie, can you tell me about your experience with diversity and in the art world and how that kind of led you to start up the Guts Gallery? It was um, the lack of diversity um, that made me set up Guts. I got into an MA at RCA and I couldn't go because I couldn't afford it, didn't have the funds. They kind of insinuated I'd get in, I'd get this bursary and that just didn't happen. And at that point I was sofa hopping and it was all a bit, it wasn't great. Um, so I thought, right, I'm just gonna kind of put this negative into a positive. And I lived above a pub for a little bit. There was a room in there, started exhibiting some artwork and then I moved out the pub and thought, right, I'm gonna actually do this. And then I just started Guts. And with Guts, we support minority artists and we exhibit them with established artists to create this platform of support. Um, with the diversity side of it, I think within the arts, it does mirror, you know, austerity in general, socially, you know, so it benefits people who do not experience, you know, racial oppression, um, any discrimination, you know, homophobia, anything like that. Um, so yeah, I think it was a frustration at the world in general. And I put that into an art gallery somehow. And then it kind of just kicked off. And now I'm a bit like, uh. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. I mean, you had like the Guerrilla Girls and Arthur Jaffa uh, part of your exhibitions, haven't you, that you put on? Well, Arthur Jaffa I was in touch with. Um, but Guerrilla Girls, yeah, they're, they're really funny. They've got um, like pseudonyms, so they're called like Frida Kahlo and stuff. So they'll be like, dear Ellie, I'll be like, dear Frida. <laughs> like, <laughs> nice yeah. to meet you, like, have a good day and stuff. But yeah, there was a, a few established artists who really backed Guts. And that just was amazing. Like, you know, watching an artist who is emerging and struggling and from quite like a working class background and everything. I don't know, it was just, it was really amazing seeing like how the face lit up when yeah. they fit in with such like a you know, renowned artist. How yeah. did you get about getting those artists involved? What, what I messed with them, I thought, oh, I've got now to lose. I'm just gonna give them a message, see what happens. And then they got back to me and I was like, oh, <laughs> like really? it's happening. Yeah, there's, you just have to go for it, I think, um, and stuff like that. Yeah, Great. if you don't ask, you don't get, I think, a lot of the time. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Great. Uh, Tinu, what about you? How has your experience of diversity or lack of in the art world? And, um, you know, how have you overcome that and to become an illustrator and make money out of that? How, what have you had to do to do so? Um, well, for me, like I always knew that I wanted to be an artist, like it was always my thing, but I never felt represented in you know the art that I saw and the artists that were shown to me. And then, so in A level, like I had a turning point when an art teacher, you know, introduced me to Yinka Shani Barry's art because I could relate to it and I could see how I could, you know, tell my own story and include my own narrative in the work. So then I went on to study illustration at uni did the three years and then I left just not knowing how to then make that transition into the art world. It was like a free fall, like I didn't know what the steps were necessarily. So I tried to go for internships, you know, in the creative world, like graphic design or anything creative. And it was just like rejection after rejection after rejection. So then I, was, I had to make the decision, like if no one was gonna hire me, I'll just hire myself. So. And then I made the step to go freelance, which is difficult, but I was like, I'm just going to make the art that I want to make and then just upload it to Instagram, see if anyone's interested, see if there's, if anything grows from that. And slowly like, I started to get commissions and work with people. And it was probably six months into the freelance life that um, I saw Aspen's call out on Facebook to join Riot Soup. And for me, like everything that she was talking about, like women of color and artists, I, like, I needed that. 
because I found the freelance life is quite isolating because it's just you and I didn't know what I was doing I was just trying to work it out googling everything and trying to find events and networking and it's quite it's quite difficult but you know with Riot Sue the way we just clicked straight away it was like I found you know my community and my tribe and I think that's very important for mm -hmm. you know emerging creatives out there just you know people who are that because it's it's difficult it's yeah not easy out there but i think once you find your tribe it can be a like a great support system because i found myself doing things that i never envisioned i would do like like this and like public speaking events because i just wanted to draw and try and live off of it so good i think it's quite interesting you mentioned uh, you were going for internship and stuff like that and i have spoken to ellie about this before your policy on having for the guts gallery having people doing voluntary stuff and doing in turn what is your policy on that it's quite strong isn't it uh, you don't like you pay everybody like, everybody who works for me i pay them like at least the london living wage i don't agree with unpaid internships i think i just think it's disgusting and mm -hmm. you need to realize that people's time is value and they deserve like they deserve to be paid like I don't know, I've got a massive problem with it and I'm trying to prove as a smaller gallery if I can do it, everyone can do it, up to Saatchi, like there's no excuses with it and that's very important for Guts and we do want to push that and be quite vocal about that with other galleries as well. Yeah, and I think that's really important because really the people that can afford to go as an intern or voluntary, they're also the people that got money, so that's yeah. talking about diversity and we're talking about class. Yeah, uh, so. you know, if you're a working class artist uh, and you're trying to make in the art world, you've got to feed yourself one way or another. And, you know, I think all of us, you know, I work as an educator to allow me then to have a couple of days working in the studio. And I think all of us got different jobs that we do to carry on. So not to think that, you know, there's very few people that can just live off being an artist or running a gallery or you know, whatever it is, or an art collective, you do have to work on the side to carry on. And I think that it's important that we point that out so people realise that don't give up your dreams. If you have to do a part-time job, it doesn't make you any less. That's what we all do to move on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay, well, I want to move on to our first uh, point that I want to talk about. And I want to start with uh, the death of Stephen Lawrence. And in 1999, the McPherson report that was making recommendations for how to move on with the institutional racism within the police. Now, this report wasn't directed towards the art or the culture media section was not targeted for this report. However, we can trace the uptake or would later become culture diversity within this institution following on from this report. So that was a young black boy that died and this had an impact on how people uh, conducted their business within institutions. Uh, and diversity as a term was not really used before this. Uh, when New Labour and the years following Tony Blair's election in 1997, there was like a flurry of diversity schemes within public funded cultural institutions. One of those institutions was, was the Art Council and they decided that art organisations would require diversity strategy within their companies to be able to qualify for funding. As did the UK Film Council that was established in 2000 with diversity being one of the 13 key objectives to receive funding as well as culture diversity network that was created in 2000 to support diversity initiatives within the TV sector. However, when I talk to people that are in those industries, and what become quite obvious was that black people and people of colors were all often employed as runners or PAs, and very seldom got a chance to move further up in those industries. And then kind of because of austerity like that came on, something went wrong. We had the economic crash in 2009. 
And then diversity kind of got me to the side and it become about economics and social, social interests was put to the side. And we kind of only got worse ever since then. So I felt, I was in London at that time in the beginning of 2000 and it felt as a person, as a black person, there was a chance to get into certain industries. But as we moved on, that <coughs> took chance of lessened more and more. Now, with another black man dying, well, that happens not just, but that became a global thing with George Floyd. And my worry is that the same thing is going to happen again, that institutions have now come out because of Black Lives Matter, and they have made a statement in regards to their changes to tackle diversity. And I'm worried that gallery is going to open up with a few black artists, and they're going to go back to the same way again, showing the white male uh, artists from the European canon. So my question here is, starting with you, Ellie, what can we do as artists, collectives, gallery representatives to stop this being a trend and make sure that this is a genuine change towards diversity? I think firstly we need to recognise our privilege. Like as a white curator, I am a gatekeeper within the art world and I've got to cut those keys. Like you just have to and it should just be an unsaid thing. But what I've realised within the art world is there's not protocol. Like there's, there's no real protocol that we all have to abide by. And within every other industry, there is this. <clears throat> and that's something that really should be put into place. I think the education side of it as well, that is the, that is the root to everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, education has to be part of galleries. Um, we need to get to a point where it's just unsaid and we do this, but there's so much to be done. And that always starts with dialogue. There needs to be a conversation, there needs to be an ongoing conversation. There needs to, it's our time to stop, like as white people, just stop and listen. That's, the, that's what you have to do. And that's how you make change. It's, you know, looking at the problem, finding a solution. And I don't know, just stepping down. This isn't our time. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you. Uh, Tine, do you have anything to add to that? What was your idea about how, what we can do as artists or collectives? What can we do to sort of keep this from, stop this from just being a trend and actually be a, a start to real change? Yeah, I think it's difficult, but I think we've got to just, you know, keep doing what we're doing, you know, keep being vocal, keep trying our best to be visible, you know, keep putting our work out there and, you know, keep putting our own shows on and our own events and not, you know, just wait for institutions to come to us to actually, you know, you know, like with Riot Sue, put on our own exhibitions and our own residencies to try and be seen, you know. Yeah. And, I, and I like what I've seen, like, on Twitter at the minute with, like people, like institutions, you know, making statements and then people who have actually worked with the institutions coming out and being like, okay, but I wasn't treated this way. It's like, don't just make the empty statement, like actually make the action to go with it. And I like people challenging these statements, Yeah. you know, making sure the institutions pull up. Yeah, thank you. Asma, have you got anything to add? Yeah, I think um, it's about accountability. We need to hold ourselves accountable. Um, we have all varying um, levels of privilege and um, just holding ourselves accountable and applying pressure to these institutions. Because I think a lot of these amazing movements always happen from the bottom up. So as long as we keep going and we keep showing up for ourselves, each other, um, I think that will be a positive sort of, and it, it will yield change. I think another thing is, I really hate these words, diversity and inclusion. And I think it's time we abolish those and like we replace it with anti-racism and decolonization. I think we need to move in more radical spaces and use these more powerful, meaty, specific terms because we need to be more explicit about what we want because these mm -hmm. sort of umbrella terms, they're tokenistic and they don't quite hit the mark because if they did, we won't be sitting here having this conversation. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well said. Yeah, I like that. Right. Well, I'm going to move on to something else and in regards to Black Lives Matter and the importance of social media for this movement. So Instagram was massive to make it a global movement. Um, the cultural institutions that mostly post artwork by white, straight, male artists from the European canon uh, and the galleries and the museums were largely silent during this time. Uh, and it's for Dr. many taking up to like weeks to kind of come up with any response and some still haven't responded at all. However, there was some fantastic artwork being posted by black artists and people of color frequently on Instagram during this period of time. Uh, there was images of Kara Walker's from Americanos, that is a take, that lovely sculpture. David Hammond's African-American flag. Glenn Lennon's uh, neon light spelling America. But this image just didn't come from the institutions that actually held these pieces of art or owned them. They were like posted by activists and artists. And after various calls of change from activists and artists and gallery owners, uh, um, some, art, some galleries came up with, responded. So Housen with, which is a blue, Blue Chip Gallery, and I'm not sure if everybody that's listening knows what that is, but Blue Chip is basically art with great value, which keeps its value or expected to rise. So that's the sort of artist that they chose. So it's kind of all about, well, not all about the money, but it's a lot about the money, let's not lie. Uh, they sort of posted a comment saying they're searching for a solution. Some galleries also promise to look into the system and evaluate that for change. Big words, let's see some actions. Tate posted a picture of Chris Ophelia's No Woman or Cry painting and outlined it a duty to speak up for human rights and anti-racism. So anti-racism, they use that term, which is good. We like that, like Asma was mentioning. Some galleries stayed very safe and posted things like Martha Luther King's quotes. However, the Guts Gallery posted, art galleries, museums, and high profile figures in the art world. Why are you not using your influence platform right now to speak out against racism and put these words into action? You are scared your position in the art world may be compromised. You are scared collectors, donors, patrons will no longer support you. White silence is compliance. Black life matters, and your silence will be remembered. Ellie, th those are that. I mean, that I remember seeing that post and stopping and going, "Wow, that that's good." Uh, how did you come to a decision to post this message? I just everybody should have been posting that message. I <laughs> that that's what was so frustrating. Everybody should have posted that. But with that message, it was more of a a question for people to question themselves so I didn't like almost push it as a statement it was um I don't know I had some galleries get back to me and say look like we've actually questioned ourselves because of that statement and everything um I just it was I just find it so disgusting how these big high profile institutions just posted one post and that was it. They're not accountable. And that's what we talked about earlier, accountability. Yeah. Like, he, like you've made a mistake, like fix it. Realize what that problem was and fix it. And don't just try and play it safe. Like, yeah, you'll have, you know, your patrons and everything. That's great. But morally, like, I don't know, just morally, it's just so off, off the grid and that it will be remembered. Yeah, it definitely will be remembered. I particularly like that line. Yeah, I'll, I'll ensure that it's remembered. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> how you, Ellie? How you use social media to help you grow Guts Gallery? How you use the Instagram to actually help you to grow? Is it? Have you found it a useful tool? Yeah, Instagram's um, is quite mad. It's a bit scary, I think. Instagram, because um, once you put something out there, it's out there forever. Yeah, but. Um, yeah, it, it helped me a lot, and especially because I've moved a lot of the exhibitions online. Um, 
it's just been perfect. It's a free way of building an exhibition and helping artists. And it's so accessible for everybody. So accessible. But there always are um, downfalls of Instagram. For example, with the, the Black Square, a lot of vital resources were covered up and more people actually posted the Black Square than they did with the petition um, for George Floyd. So there's negatives and positives of Instagram. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Asma, what, what did the right suit do during this time of Black Lives Matter when they first sort of exploded onto the scene? Uh, not much, because um, it's not new. Racism is not new. We, we weren't like, like, oh my God, what is this? We have to post about it. We weren't amazed, we weren't shocked, we weren't surprised. I think a lot of the girls in the group are just tired. We're all just fed up with police brutality and you know racism, all this stuff. Um, we did post a black square, funny enough. Uh, we didn't use the, the wrong hashtag, we used the right hashtag. Um, we just did that in solidarity. Um, and every Tuesday we hold space in the stories and ask questions. We try, we're trying to keep the Blackout Tuesday vibe going by asking questions in the stories and seeing what the people who are following us, seeing what they have to say and trying to like, just remind them every week this is still going on and whatever. Um, I think as, the reason why we're doing that is because, um, you know, we're not an authority. Um, everyone is still learning. We should all still be developing our knowledge, information, you know, position everything constantly. So that's why we ask, we ask questions and we don't make these bold statements, you know, as a lot of people did. Um, so we want to, we want to hear from people and because community is at the base and the heart of everything that we do and we, we want to we want others to feed into what we're doing it's very important um, because that's that's what's lacking and that's what's missing from the world so we have to operate differently if we want different results um, and oh, what did I want to say I wanted to say something yeah, um, Ellie, you know, you mentioned that the galleries got back to you and said whatever they said. I, I wonder if Riot Soup had posted that, if we would have got the same response. You know, I think that's something to note. And that's um, what the problem is. Yeah, exactly. So it's, we need like these white representatives in, in the industry to be doing that because they're not listening to us because we've been screaming, crying and banging on drums about this for like ever. Um, so it's now new. Yeah. It's, it's not, not new. And it's, it's not new. I don't know why everyone's clutching their pearls. Like, oh my God. Also, BLM is not new. BLM did not start with George Floyd. Um, Trayvon Martin, seven years ago, and we were there. We were protesting at the American Embassy. We were there. Um, I think a lot of this performative stuff online is just irking me differently. Um, I think real allyship, the real movement is offline. I think Instagram, social media is a tool. It's not the work. And people really need to make that distinction. And also please remember that anyone with access to a word processor and like a couple thousand followers can say anything about any topic and sound like an authority and make what they're saying like gospel. So um, books is where it's at for the information, not Instagram. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> we, we, can, we can inspire by Instagram. We yeah. can get people to inspire. So. It's not a totally useless, it's a but it's, been, it's a start. Yeah. Um, Tinu, could you, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, like, I agree with Asma in, on the performative side of a lot of the statements on Instagram. And, you know, like, for me personally, when it all happened, like, I was overwhelmed because, like, during that time, everything was, like, emotionally heightened and, you know, like I've been living this, like racism is not new. I, I felt it like my whole life. So I feel like it shouldn't be on, you know, black people, on people of color, you know, to make these statements because it, but we've, been li we've been living this, like this is our reality. So, you know, for me, I didn't make a big statement. I feel like there's other people out there, you know, activists and things who can word everything that I'm thinking and feeling a lot more eloquently than I could. So I just tried to share the information and the resources that I could and do what I could with my art in terms of like raising money and sharing the message that way. Yeah. But yeah. If, 
Uh, and what about Instagram as a tool for you as an artist? Have you yeah. found it useful as such? Yeah, Just definitely. Little, yeah? Yeah, definitely. Because for me, I don't think I would be where I am today in my freelance career without Instagram. Because, Like I said, I got started through posting my art on Instagram. And that's how I found my first clients. Like some of the biggest clients I've had today have found me through Instagram. You know, because it's, it's largely a visual platform. So it, it works for artists and creatives as a way to share your world, like to share your work you know, globally and, you know, get your message out there. So I think, I mean, and also like Ellie was saying, you managed to, during the COVID, you managed to move that show online. So it's, a, it's been a good tool for that as well. Some galleries have done that and that's been really good to keep that going. So it is, as an artist and a gallery, Run, it's, it's, it's a use, would you all agree that it's, it sort of evens out the claim? So if you haven't got access to the art world, that you can get yourself out on Instagram and you don't need to ask anyone for a permission to do so. So it's a good tool for anyone that listens now and thinking about getting their work out. Do that, keep on doing that. And like you say, you've got some clients from it, you managed to get your show that you were going to have in the gallery on it. So you, you know, those artists still got their work show. Because a lot of artists, obviously you and COVID and this time, I had a show that was supposed to have that got cancelled. You know, that we all kind of yeah. been affected by that. So it's quite, you know, it's good that Instagram maybe had a little bit of an impact to be able to still get your work out there. Uh, right. I'm going to move on. Uh, to positive elements of diversity from within the art in regards to black and people of color and LGBTQ+. So there's been some really good shows or some blockbuster shows, good or not good, depends on your view on this. Basket retrospective at the Barbican. We had the Queer British Art at the Tate Britain. We had Kendi Wiley and Amy Sherrill do the official portraits of the Obamas. We had Soul of the Nation at the Tate Modern. And we had Sonia Boyes is set to represent the UK in 2022's Venice Benedal. Uh, but it would be the first black female artist to do so. So if I can first direct this to you, Ellie, in regards to being a queer artist, how successful was that show, the queer British art at Tate Britain? Is it a little bit strange to put all those queer artists together in one show like that? I do find it quite funny when people do that. It's just like, <laughs> put all the queers in one room. It's quite dangerous to do that as well. But um, yeah, it's great. It's great. Um, but also, I do think as a queer person, we have, like, I have a lot more privilege than a lot of other people. Um, I don't know, like there's still so much more that can be done. Yeah. But I think in general, I don't know, it's not like we're taking up too much space, but there's a lot more going on. Like right now it's about black POC artists. Like as a queer, you know, queer white people, I think it shifted slightly. I think actually we are quite privileged and we've come a long way in the art world and we need to recognise that. So there's a, there is a conversation within that, definitely. That's interesting. So you think that we need to now focus on black and people of colour and really work that and take other diversities to the side for a moment. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think just, you know, take a step back. But also it should have always been about black and POC. That should have always been the case. That's okay. what's so infuriating and disgusting that that should have always been the case. But it is again, recognizing your privilege within, you know, even the queer community. You do still need to recognize that. Right, thank you for that. And what about, what did we think? So asthma, for example, why is it taking so long for, uh, for Sonia Boyce to be the first black female artist why is, why is it taking so long? What do you think? Why, why is it, you know? 
how how is it possible? Because there's a lot. I would say there's a lot yeah. of really talented black female artists out there, and it's just I find just, it shocking. Yeah, because it's not like there aren't any artists doing creating work. That's not no. really the issue. Um, I think um, it's just the lack of lack of value and appreciation. Yeah. Um, well, for us, you know. Um, to lock myself together in this big category as if uh, we're, we are all one. Um, but I think there's a shift um, and I think it has to be led by us. And what do you think, Anis? <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to end my answer, I'm well, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. I mean, I just think, <laughs> you know, is it that the art world, don't, because everything is led by money, isn't it? It's all about yeah. money. Of course. So it is, is it truly that, they oh, believe just, that they're not going to sell this work by black female artists? Is that, is that really? I, I think that's what they think. That's the reason why yeah they're and maybe that's that's up. the reason why whenever there's like a, a black show it's like this big group show as well as if uh, one black artist can't hold his or her own um they always sort of lump you know all the black artists together in one they're always great shows they're fun to go to and stuff but well let's, let's think, see one at a time you know put the spotlight on, on you you know yeah well because if you looked at the soul of the nation that was packed yeah, it was. No, you never yeah. see so many black people in the gallery. I mean, there was like, you know, it was, we were obviously, we were thirsty for this stuff. Do you know what I mean? We wanted to see it. It wasn't yeah. that nobody didn't visit that show. Do you know what I mean? It was so busy on a Friday night. It felt like being out in a bar or a club. I mean, it was properly like, it's electric it atmosphere. It was <laughs> yeah. good. People were loving it. And they weren't particularly quiet either, which was nice. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> did, you, um, did you go to the Get Up Stand Up show, Somerset yes. House? That was yeah. another one that was really like quite, quite vibesy. Yeah. And that, I mean, people of colour and black people, we just bring a different element to things, you know? We've got <laughs> like, you know, we've got this, this different kind of energy and I mean, they appropriate us all the time. Just yeah. give us the spotlight and just let us show us, let us show you what we have. Don't. We well, just want to steal, steal our shit, appropriate it, and then repackage it and say it's theirs, you know? That's well, I think the, the fact that these shows were so busy shows you that there is a, an audience for it. So, like, yeah. let's put it out there. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I'm slightly conscious about time, so I'm going to move on. And we have uh, Ava Langre as a woman of colour, is currently the artistic director of Freeze London. Fortunately, freeze. Well, fortunately or for, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your view of freeze, it's not on this year. Uh, and she said that the art industry em embraces the success of African American artists, but still ignoring the work of Black and people of color artists locally, i.e., British, allowing us to shy away from our history of racism while scrutinizing American narrative. I mean, I think. Personally, I think that's very true. But then we also have like the Black Artist Modernist National Collective Audit has found that there are actually around 2,000 works by Black artists in the UK on, in permanent collections. So museums and big galleries. But most of them are not on display. Now, the, for this change to happen, you know, for the work to be out there, to be, to be shown, we need it to be that museums are buying the work of black artists and people of color because these permanent collections is what matters. That is what makes the canon of art. That stops the European canon of art being not only just white, but male, you know, male white, which is, you know, what loads of kids get taught at school, which is totally wrong. And we need to, as educators, make a real effort to change that. But really what is going to make a change is the checkbook. Get the checkbook out and start buying this stuff. You know, that is the only change that's going to happen. So how can we make, how can we push this for the British institutions to support black art 
uh, black artists from Britain and people of colour. Tanuka, have you got any idea? <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how you can push the, the massive institutions, but I know we need more we need more funding. Like you said, it's about the money and like we need more grants and more opportunities, like residences. We need them, you know, we need them to break down the barriers because it is very elitist and it and it's difficult. Like I like I never imagined or could picture probably still to this day cat pictures ever see in my work or someone like me's work in one of these massive you know old school like British galleries because I've never I feel like I've never seen myself represented in, represented it in them so I don't know if they see us as valuable or marketable I'm not sure how we get them to, to see our work yeah because it is about marketable, isn't it? Because it is about the yeah. money. It's always going to be about the money. Ellie, have you got any ideas how we can push the British institutions into actually starting bringing out the checkbook and, and, and investing in people, black artists living and working in Britain today? Well, especially with the collectivists that I work with who buy the artist's work, I have quite like a close relationship with them. And there's a new generation of collectors that I've realized who are coming in, like the new generation of artists and gallerists, who are actually buying and purchasing, you know, work by black artists and POC artists and queer eyes and working class. Well, m all my artists on, on goods are like <laughs> either one of those. So. But there is a shift, I'm seeing a shift, but it's about dialogue and conversation. And I think also it's about the community as well um, and it's about sharing these resources and pushing you know this message and that's what's so important i don't know it's like how do you get somebody to give money i think you just have to be very honest and transparent about what's happening yeah yeah like saw it out you know what i mean like yeah. bring out bring out the checkbook yeah get it out exactly which you very good at saying those things, Ellie. I, I really admire you for that because you do, you do speak what you think, which is great. Uh, Asma, have you got any ideas? Well, I think we need to look at who's working in the institutions. And, um, you know, we need people who look like us, who think like us, who can advocate for us in these positions of influence. And, you know, the decision makers, the people at the top, not, not, the runners and the admin assistants and you know the people in precarious positions and i think once we get a more diverse uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> workforce lack of better word guys then um then maybe that's like a step towards that and then but how do we do that um that's like a really big question but i think it, it then you start sort of looking into politics and and that arena um but i think yeah it's it's sort of it's this this advocating for one another but if there's there's no one who who represents us in these on these boards and on these you know in these meetings then they're not going to think of us so that's yeah. that's what we need i mean in a really small example i've i've, I've done it with riot soup so the first opportunity with tate you know the at the end of the of the workshop they were like you know we want you back it's, you know we had a great time will you come back and i was like yeah but not without riot soup so if i can do it on this tiny level can you just imagine you know on a bigger scale and then that then the money will come i yeah. think i hope we'll see i mean and, I, back, and then back to accountability <laughs> as yeah. mentioned before and I also think very much it's about the next generation as well. Um, you know, I don't want a repeat of what we've gone through. Or, or, no. I mean, I'm slightly older than some of you, you know. But I think it's about education and it's about educators. So me as an art teacher, you know, it's about showing people that work and give that the same value so they grow up to recognise that the work by black artists is as valid as a, a white artist artists and I think but it, we can't it can't just be the black educators doing this so it needs to start when they train teachers you know they need to start in universities when they train teachers to make them aware of how important that is 
but I do think education has got a big part of this and we have to make sure that we're doing we're changing it now that we make a change and we can't be waiting for you know the conservative party to come down with a new legislation because that's just not going to happen you know that's not going to happen so it, we have to take it on ourselves as educators to actually make that change ourselves until we have managed to change this government uh, you know I, I, so i think yeah everybody has to work from their little corner whatever yeah. they've got to give and, and collectively we can we can make a change um right and another thing now there is lots of institutions and individuals that support black arts and people of color lgbt plus artists um we got a, we got a list here that i want to leave with the carrot center for them to sort of if people want to uh get access to it they can contact them but i also would like people that are watching to contribute and if they're aware of things send it on to the care center it'd be really nice if it was something we can build on to give people uh you know that come from a, a low income or uh you know a struggling family that use centers like that actually give them some access to where the funding lies where you what which institutions are helping them and start building because i really believe in people you know growing together you know not one person getting to the top you know like all of us it's not like let's not keep any secrets let's share what we got and help yeah. people along i think that's really really important there's enough to go around definitely it is yeah. <laughs> it seems like quite a lot of the same people get get the stuff so let's spread it yeah yeah let's yeah. spread it out <laughs> yeah. yeah let's do it Anis <laughs> there, there I'm working on it. um at this point I would like to ask Farid to join us and if there have been any questions uh thank you very much everybody this is Farid from the Carrot Center the main manager hello everyone I'm Farid and Mary I wasn't I really enjoyed listening to that and we've had a few comments here that I'm just going to read through. I'm going to ask everyone if you have any questions for the panel please do ensure that you add it to the chat box now and uh, we'll work our, our way through them today. So a comment here, um, we all need access to private clubs and private art clubs where we have to nominate people and feel and the fees run thousands which keep different folks out these are spaces where decisions and actions are made with limited perspectives uh, what are your opinions on this and this is for the all panelists okay so what you're saying that we need more we need access to more clubs that yes. are not art clubs that allows people to develop their techniques and talents and so on mm. but that are not costing the earth so so it's more so well, is that something that the Carrot Centre do? Which, I mean, you started with the art stuff. So I started working with you during COVID because you offered, you decided to bring in the arts, which you haven't been doing there for before, but yeah. you decided to invite artists to give online lessons. So uh, is this something that you're going to continue? Yes, um, it's something that we really would like to continue. Um, and it really has proven popular with our community and it's led to us really engaging with and expanding our community and engaging with a diverse uh, group of individuals and um, and again um, our community is sharing the, the art they produce and it's just it's fantastic and I immediately see uh, representation within the, the artwork that's been shared and we, we really do hope to have an exhibition whether it is um, and we are going to be approaching some of these big galleries to see will they be willing to have a, a group exhibition of all of our art together and um, it's something that I'm really hoping for um, and that's something that I'm, I'm working on right now. Good, good. And you're going to open up the space for people to actually come in and, and once we be on this COVID when we can actually get back together and which I believe we can soon. Yes. Uh, that you are actually going to open up the space for people to actually come in and do workshops Absolutely. in your space. I yeah. did. So that's one space. Uh, now, I believe that the tape run, like the workshop you were running, Asma, was that free? 
yeah, it was it was free. Um, they do take late, like um, last Friday of every month. Um, I've had a really good relationship with the curators who run that program. Um, I find them to be quite fair in the way that they operate. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they, um, but they but, pay you as well, don't they, Taylor? It's like, they're good like that. Yeah. I, I, they're, they're lovely people, you know? And I think maybe then it comes down to this sort of concept and question of allyship. And how do we, how do we change hearts and minds and how do we build this network of allies who can advocate for us in these secret clubs that we don't have access to and can't afford entry into, you know? Um, how do we do that? Yeah. Uh, Tino, have you got, are you aware of any places where people can come and take part in art workshops and, and, and it's not costing the earth? Um, well, I have, I know someone who I did an exhibition with, they're called Better Shared and they're, they're a good network. They often do workshops and um, yeah, with artists, like it's a whole network and there's always artists on there who are willing to do workshops. It, I think you have to pay, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's costly. I think it's like 10 pounds, five to 10 pounds. So. We have a question from Denise, uh, and this is for all panelists. Do you think that the way forward is black art shows to show strength and solidarity like the other story back in 1989? Can you say that again, sorry? Do you think that the way forward is black art shows to show strength and solidarity like the other shows back in 1989 or do you think you need to assimilate? So this is something that I also was going to ask about when you run out of time and it's about like positive discrimination isn't it and how do we feel about that to get together and and a little bit like create a space I don't really know how to say, but yeah, there is a space for that, that, that we said before, to get together to have art shows. But there are also, I don't know, there's something about positive discrimination that makes one feel that you not have a right to be there. Does that make sense? That, you know, mm -hmm. so you kind of want to be selected on merit, don't you? But so that's, I think that's really important that we still keep the merit that the quality of the work is there for those shows. Uh, I don't know if that answered the question really, because, well, say that question again so we can try that one again. <laughs> so uh, from Denise, do you think there was, that the way forward is black art shows to show strength and solidarity, like the other shows back in 1989, or do you think you need to assimilate? Um, Denise also mentions that other story was a big art show and Mish Kapoor didn't take part. So big artists wouldn't take part in what he okay. thought was a marginalised exhibition. Okay. So that, so that oh, is that. Okay. So do we, uh, do, uh, you see, I think it should be mixed together. I don't think it should be separate because I think that's the whole point. I don't really want to be seen as a black artist. I want to be seen as an artist. Does that make sense? I don't know how the rest of it, what, yeah. as, what's, your, what's your view of this? Uh, I have a very complex view because I think, um, not speaking for black artists or black people, but just from the, the other lens, um, I think we need to do both at the same time. Um, okay. So I think th there's space to assimilate and also there is such freedom in averting the white gaze from our work and what we do and you know the audience that comes and just gets what we're doing and and connects yeah. with our work without the need for all this explanation um but i think there's there's space and room for for both things to happen at the same time um that's just um speaking for myself as like an other person yeah uh, i don't know yeah. what do you think you know yeah i i agree with that because i think there's something about you know taking up space in these in these white institutions and you know like being loud and sharing your narrative but also there's something you know beautiful about being in a room with a community that gets it and can relate to it and it's a, yeah. it's a different feeling but, i mean again it goes back to what we were saying about these big shows where you, you just lump 
all the black people together. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's kind all the it's all the queer complex. all the queer people together. Exactly. I mean, would you, exactly. Ellie? Would you as a gal? Would you put on a show of just black artists? How would you? Would I, I, some... Well, I'd get a. I don't know. I'd employ curators as well, and you know, it's not. I'd, yeah, both. But it would. It would. I'd get a. You know, I'm working at the moment with. Well, I've been working for like five months with this brilliant curator, Raven de Clark, and. <laughs> you know Raven? Yeah, we all know Raven. Oh, you know yeah. Raven? Well, we, all, we were in a show together. Yeah. The Ryan oh, show. Raven, are, Ryan me and Raven are really tight. I like Raven so much. And we've been um yeah, working together on this amazing show. And I just wanted to like hand up the platform, you know, take a step yeah. back. And then I do that also with like different curators, like, you know other working class curators and stuff and I just see who they exhibit and it's interesting and it's nice and it's natural it's not false you're not ticking a box yeah. that's the worst thing you yeah. don't like a box we've got a question from Vicky Young do you think the art world has a bigger responsibility than other sectors slash industries to be a trailblazer for change if so why and that's for all panelists anyone want to start with that <laughs> <laughs> I feel like um, like the art world, artists and creative are always seen as being more like open-minded. So I feel like people naturally will assume that the art world will be trailblazing, but like as we know, like traditionally, it's not necessarily diverse. So I don't know. I think do they have a responsibility? I don't know, maybe, yeah. But I think every sector and industry has the responsibility. It's not just the art world, because we need to see change everywhere, not just in the creative sector. Yeah. Sure, that answers it. Yeah, I think I, think <laughs> I, I, I agree with you there. That is, yeah, you know, right. it has to be across all the industries. And we all know that the art industry is no different from any other industry. You know, yeah. and so, no, I don't think they should lead it. I think they should go along with all the other industries and it needs to be changed across all industries. I think the art world needs to catch up with other industries. I think we're very behind. We need to yeah. really pull our pace um, because it's not working. That model isn't working anymore. And that's quite interesting because I think a lot of people are not necessarily involved in the art world think of them as being really progressive and alternative but that's not really uh, you've got some you know <laughs> right wing yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah we don't have the money <laughs> nah it's, <laughs> it's all from the top yeah a question from uh, Verity Babs what can white art viewers best do to support the cause of diversity Art viewers, yes, are talking about people that attend galleries, yeah. yeah, people that attend galleries, and that's all panelists. I think look, look for us, look for the grassroots people trying to do something. Um, mix up your you know, your day, don't just go to the big galleries, come and see us, come and seek us out, and um, and ask what we're doing, and ask how you can support us, and give us some money. We need money. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, I think as well, if you have, if you, if you're, in, if you're in a position where you can share an opportunity, share that opportunity with us as well, because mm -hmm. not everyone has money, but you can pass on a good word, some good feedback, you know, from everything from like posting us on your Instagram to buying a piece of work to sharing a link to something that we might find useful. All of these things matter, and they all count. There's no action that's too small. Mm -hmm. yeah, everyone t you know everyone can do something you know mm -hmm. I'm mindful of the time there's one more question uh, Mariah asks uh, don't you need space for both and that's referring to Denise's question the first question Denise's question was it should it be single black show like yeah. one show or should it be I think we answered that earlier I think Tinu said that or both asked Mantina said that it should be both mm -hmm. right 
that there is a space for both is was your view on the matter wasn't it yeah yeah uh, fabulous so there's a lot of uh, agreement there um, <laughs> i agree with you both absolutely wonderful great so we've actually reached 7 30 um, and I would like to thank you all for this um, really important discussion that you're having here. Um, it's going to be shared on our uh, YouTube channel and also I will be referring back to it when I approach different galleries to our, to our future exhibition. It will happen very soon, um, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. So again, thank you all for participating. Thank you all for joining us today and uh, sharing your questions with the panel. Thank you, thank Farida, you. for having us. Thank you, so much. That's great. thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. All right, have yeah. a lovely <laughs> evening. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.